Good evening. Back in the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci famously told his, his students to realize that everything is connected to everything else. 500 years later, we've, we've caught up with that. We're actually at a point now where everything is connected to everything else. It always was in that deep sense, but now we live it day to day, moment to moment. If you doubt it, just think of the journey that we've been on this evening and how miraculous that actually is. I mean, our speakers have taken us through these extraordinary worlds and these journeys of connecting dots and insights and breakthroughs, learnings, and then think about how each one of those journeys and each one of those speakers connected to all of the others and all of the possibilities that began to emerge from that. And then think about all that they've done to connect to other people and the journeys that they're on. And it, it just goes on. So it's pretty amazing, right? Um, but maybe there's some problems too. So one of them is that it turns out that the everything covers a lot of ground. So if everything connects to everything else, we're talking about people, we're talking about ideas, we're talking about fears and hopes and aspirations, and we're talking about uh, narratives and inventions and artifacts, and then we're talking about the things that they all create, including the uh, ideas and images and artifacts that are created now by the machines that we create. So there's a lot of dots out there potentially to connect. How do we find our way through that? How do we keep from being overwhelmed by it? How do we find the right ones? So my idea that I'd like to, to, to share with you today is really a simple one, and that's that we all have inside of us some basic abilities to do that through our creativity, that art is a way that we can bring that creativity to life and to form and to work with it. So to help explore that topic, we have, we have uh, four volunteers who've really generously uh, agreed to, to participate in this this evening from the uh, IE Madrid community, so thank you very much. So in a moment, um, they're going to start drawing, and I'm just going to briefly explain. I'm going to put an image up on the screen, and I'm asking them, once the image goes up, to look very carefully at it, just draw what you see, concentrate on that, try to ignore everything that I'm saying, and while they're doing the drawing, I'll share a little bit of background and context about the journey, and then we'll kind of come back together. So there's the image. Just draw what you see. And as they're doing that, I want to share a little bit about my own journey of discovery that brings me to this point. So my first language was music. I learned to read music before I learned to read English. I was a classically trained violinist. Um, then I got really interested also in conducting, and so I became a conductor. And in college, I started hanging out with a rougher crowd, so I did theater. And so music and theater were really at the very center of my life. And the first half of my career was entirely spent um, bringing music and plays to life on stage and to audiences, engaging all of those in different ways. I want to share a little bit about something really important that happened during that part of my career, which is that I had the, the, the extraordinary opportunity to spend five years uh, with one of the really great musical ensembles of the world. Uh, that ensemble is called Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. It's a fantastic orchestra. It's also known as the conductorless orchestra. It's the only orchestra in the world that rehearses and records and performs all of its work without a conductor. And my role with Orpheus wasn't to play in the orchestra, but it was to actually to be its director. So my role was to be, in a sense, the CEO of a multi-leadered organization and to help the orchestra bring things to life. So I learned a, a ton of things during my time with Orpheus. One is maybe the most important is just what it means to have an ensemble collaboration where work moves forward through a steady flow of trust, mutual respect, um, transparency, real-time feedback, uh, a really passionate commitment to what it was that was being created and then bringing that to the audience. Um, I learned in, in in working with this, or, this organization, which was really kind of a model of a flat organization, 
where the, the power and the responsibility was in the hands of the people making the music, doing the work. That that leads to some remarkable results. So it, it leads to um, really high performance teams that can do amazing things. It leads to remarkable degrees of innovation. It becomes a different, altogether different model of leadership that emerges as the roles change and rotate and everybody is involved in doing that. You know, I used to think of leadership as a process of making a bunch of decisions and choices that would be really key to benefit the, the organization and all the people in it and so forth. And what I learned through my experience at Orpheus is that it's not really so much about making decisions. I, I was the decision maker of last resort, but I could judge my effectiveness as a CEO in inverse proportion to the number of decisions I actually made. If it was working right, other people, people who maybe knew more and were more, more close to it, were actually making the decisions. And I was somehow helping that, supporting that, helping to create a culture where that would emerge and a process that would safeguard that. So we began to work with this not only in the orchestra, but it was such a powerful example, we began to take it out in, in, in the world. And uh, we began to explore not only making music, but helping organizations to find new ways of working together. And that had some very powerful impacts. And that's when I began to realize that there was more going on here than a remarkable orchestra working in a very unusual way, that there was something happening which we came to call arts-based learning. What I meant was that the artistic skills and processes and experiences could be used to help teach and transform individuals and organizations across a really wide range of activity and endeavor. So after I left Orpheus, I spent some time writing and thinking about it and also looking around and discovering that it wasn't limited to conductorless orchestras, that there were all sorts of possibilities embedded in every art form for people to learn and express and grow. How are you guys coming there? Is that coming along? I can give you another couple of minutes on it. Okay, so we began to, uh, to, to work with that, calling it arts-based learning, and I realized once I took it beyond the orchestra that I had a really great personal passion for two things about arts-based learning. One, for what it could do, the power of it, the impact of it on innovation, on organizations, the ways that it could change the world. And the second, I had a passion for really understanding what was going on here. How is this working? How is this possible that it could have so much power and such ability to transform and to help us to transcend all the challenges that we faced? So I formed a, a research partnership and was very fortunate to be able to form one with the National Science Foundation of the United States, which began a decade of research projects digging into those exact same questions. And that also gave me a whole range of opportunities to explore how we could apply arts-based learning to some of the most difficult challenges that the world has faced. So over these years, I've had the opportunity to, to use arts-based learning to help communities uh, deal with the challenge of, of water resources in the middle of a drought urban nutrition in the middle of food deserts, climate resilience everywhere, organizations that were trying to cope with digital transformation, the opportunities, but also the, the perils that are associated with that, with community empowerment, and, and most recently, with the tremendous crises in public health. So what I learned through all of that is that art can make a powerful difference. So this is probably a pretty good time to just kind of cut back to our, to our, our volunteer artists here working away. So uh, could you just hold up what you've done? I, I just want to see it for a minute. Great, yep, turn it, yep. Okay, t if it's upside down, turn it right side up. No, turn it the other way, very good. Okay, now stand up and, and show everybody, because these are fantastic looking horses. Right side up now, show everybody. So that, that's pretty amazing. Okay, great job, thank you, have a seat. So, I'm guessing that some of you are pretty surprised and maybe pretty impressed because we all know it's kind of hard to draw things. And none of these people are art students or professional artists. We actually screened and we accidentally had one or two people who were, so we, we found some other people instead. So um, this is, these were just four people who volunteered. So 
I can tell you that I'm impressed but not surprised because I've done this with thousands of people all over the world, and this is what people do. They produce these amazing-looking, incredibly intricate, difficult-to-do drawings of horses in about five minutes. So how do they do that? Well, there's a couple of things that work. One is that they're not thinking about horses. They've actually forgotten the name of the thing that they're seeing, which is actually where vision begins, when you're not thinking about the name of it, but you're just responding to what's there. The second thing is, in the process of doing that, when we flipped it upside down, we help people to leave behind their own self-limiting beliefs, to suspend their disbelief in themselves, and just to go with what they saw. We didn't ask them to draw horses, we asked them to draw what you see. We can all do that, and they did it wonderfully. So, those are just a few of the, the many, many powerful impacts that I've experienced using arts-based learning in all of these different environments over the years. Um, I could summarize them by saying they help us to see with, with new eyes. They help us to take in more information and do more things with it. They help to connect us to ourselves, to our communities, and to each other on really deep levels and communicate with honesty and with empathy the things that we're actually seeing and perceiving. So there's two really important things that I've learned about arts-based learning along the way that I want to share with you. One is that the arts represent a kind of a universal connector. We're talking about connecting the dots. The arts, the creativity, they come from a spark within us that we all as humans have. Every one of us has the ability to do this. But we can take it in any direction, and the arts will allow us They'll empower us. They'll suggest and enable us to connect all over the place. But they can also help us to guide us because they help us to look inside ourselves into our own authenticity and intent. They help us to look around us at the world with fresh eyes and take more of it in. They help us to connect with each other. So the other thing about the arts is that, and this, this is going to sound kind of strange, but what I've learned is that you can teach just about anybody, just about anything, with just about any art form, which is kind of amazing if you think about it, if it's true. So what I'd like to do is to show you that it's true. And to do that, I'm going to share a little bit of the data that we've developed in 10 years of research on exactly this question. So I want to start with how we connect to emotionally intelligent behavior. So what, what is the connection between, between arts-based learning and emotionally intelligent behavior? So the slide that you see behind me, this is from a study that we did out in San Diego during the, the water crisis there, and, and it was on water resources. Uh, and it was innovation teams made up of educators and scientists and community leaders that were struggling for, for, for ways forward with this. And these teams were working for five-week periods, and they were working under very tight, controlled experimental conditions because we, we did this in, in a lab that we set up. So what you see is, 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 is the emotionally intelligent behavior that the teams showed. We know it because we had raiders that were there. They were observing all five weeks of it. They were counting and coding every single behavior and categorizing it. And so what do, what do, what do we see? They got a little bit better in, in the beginning as they got to know each other a bit. And then it kind of flatlined as everybody got to know each other and it became a little harder because now we were further into the project. So there were some losers as well as winners on some of the choices being made. And so the emotional intelligence kind of just languished there. So we set up parallel teams. These teams were identical in every respect and doing the identical process for the same length of time. The only difference is we scooped out nine hours of those five weeks and replaced the work that they had been doing with upside-down horses and other forms of arts-based learning. And look at what happened. The emotionally intelligent behavior soared. It was practically three times as much by, by the end of the, uh, of the five-week period as with the other groups. So we see the same thing. We ran the same kind of tests around transparency. Same pattern. We ran the same kind of tests 
around uh, mutual respect, same pattern. We ran slightly different tests around innovation skills looking at, at teenagers. Uh, instead, with, we, had, we had expert panels that were blindly judging them. But it's the same pattern. The differences are dramatic. Those are two-point differences on a five-point scale. And with adults, a different test there too. But again, it's the same pattern. We see this across the board. So what did we actually do that produced such powerful effects? Well, we worked with clay sculpture, with Japanese water painting. We worked with jazz and chamber music and improvisational theater and idea models and upside down horses. We worked for short periods of time, but the power and the impact of that was incredible. So the implications of that are pretty profound. The, the painting that you see behind me, this is by, a painting by Georges Seurat, who was famous for his development of the style of pointillism. These are little dots or points of paint. He didn't actually connect the dots. He placed them in ways in which our eyes would connect them, our brains would connect them, would create the whole picture. So the question is, how do you want to use all this to complete your picture? With respect to emotional intelligence, with respect to transparency, mutual respect, innovation, your own creativity, our own creativity, gives us incredible power to complete these pictures. The arts give us a way to do that, to explore it, to work on it, to discover it, to develop it, to iterate on it, and to keep working at it. And so the question is, how do you want to complete the picture? So I can't possibly tell you what the right dots to connect are or how you want to comp complete your picture. All I can do is offer a suggestion. If you want to complete your picture, if these things like transparency and mutual respect and innovation, if these things matter, if emotionally intelligent behavior matters to you, to the outcome of what you're trying to achieve, then my suggestion is very simple. Find your upside down horse, ride it. Ride it to the very limits of your imagination and don't stop there. Thank you.